Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Grateful to be here amongst all of you. Uh, I'm sorry we got late in the traffic. I'll be speaking on the topic of faith in the role of faith on the spiritual path. And I'll speak this broadly. Today I'll speak more on faith as applied to our practice of the process. So tomorrow I'll speak more on talk about on the topic of faith as applied to our transformation as it is happening. So they are related, but the one is it's like faith if I if I'm sick and I need a medicine. First is that the medicine works. The second is that the medicine is working on me. And how is it working on me? So, broadly speaking, <clears throat> let's begin with uh, the, I, let's look at where Krishna talks about faith in the Bhagavad Gita. One of my friends recently told me that he was going to write a book on the Bhagavad Gita and he said he is calling that as 10 commandments of the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> <laughs> so, I told him, Please don't write a book like this. <laughs> he asked me why. I said, the Gita's mood is not the mood of commandments. The Gita's mood is more of choices and consequences. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. Now you decide what you want to do. If you see, the Gita concludes with, with a call to Arjuna to deliberate. Deliberate Shaita Dashi, Shaina Yadhe Chitta Guru. In 1863, he says, Now you deliberate in what I have said, and then you decide. So, uh, here we have a vision of a God who respects human intelligence and respects human independence. You decide what you want to do. It's interesting, but he said, no, but Krishna, he's also quite, of course, he's writing a book on the Gita, so he's very well read. So he said, no, but three verses later, that instruction is superseded, because Krishna says, Sarva Dharma <laughs> Give up all religions and surrender unto me. So, ultimately, Krishna is giving a commandment. I said, I said, yes, but if that were the essence of the Gita, then Krishna could have completed the Gita in one verse only. Isn't it? He could have just started by saying, look, Krishna is asking, Arjuna is asking, what should I do? Puchami tuam dharma sammur jeta. In 227 he says that, please tell me what am I meant to do? What is dharma? And he could have concluded by saying that, just do what I am telling you to do. But throughout the Gita, Krishna does not draw on his authority to make the point. He doesn't say, I am God, so you should do this. He gives reasoning. This is like this, this is like this, and this is why you should do this. So, when Krishna does say 1866 that, just give up everything and surrender to me, the point over there is that Krishna has already given Arjuna his options, and Arjuna is thinking, okay, which of these options should I do? Vishwanath Chakra Thakur, uh, a prominent Bhagavad Gita commentator, he says that Krishna, after he speaks this, now you deliberate deeply and decide what you want to do. So Arjuna becomes lost in thought. And Krishna said this in that chapter, and Krishna said that in that chapter, and Krishna said that in that chapter. And seeing him so deeply immersed in thought, Krishna sees. Krishna's heart overflows with compassion. In fact, the next two verses are very sweet. It is 1864, he says that Bhuya Shunume Paramambacha. Ishto Sime Dudaviti Tatomakshami Tehitam. Now I will tell you the most confidential knowledge. Sarva Kuyatam Bhuya Shunume Paramambachana. This is the top most, the top most words that I'm going to speak to you. And why am I speaking them to you? Ishto Sime Dudaviti. Because I dearly love you. It is a Ishto Sime Druda. Druda is determined. So what Krishna means over there is, I am determined to love you. 
Many of us are determined to forget Krishna, <laughs> but Krishna is determined to love us. Ishto sime dhanamiti tato makshamite tam. Because I care for you so deeply, that is why for your benefit I am speaking these words. And then after that he speaks in 865. Manmana bhava mat bhakto madhya jimam namaskuru mame vishya satyam te pratijane priyo sime. He says that the same four points which he has said earlier in 934 in the Gita. Think of me. Devote your heart to me. Offer your obeisances to me. And worship me. In this way, you come to me. Although these two verses, 934 and 1865, are similar, the stress is different. In 934, Krishna is saying, says, being engaged in this way, you will come to me. And here he says, What you will come to me, this is the truth I'm speaking because you are dear to me. So the, the, the stress is very different. In writing, uh, I'm one of my main services writing. So in writing, how you state something can make a lot of difference. Say, suppose you want to say XYZ announced, XYZ claimed. It's completely different. Announce is authority. Claim means hey, is this claiming is it right or wrong? Or you could take the same sentence, say, you know, if you want to, if say somebody is to be recommended from self from service. We might say that, okay, he had problems earlier, but he's stable now. That's one way of putting it. We could take the same two points and put it in the opposite way. He's stable now, but he had problems earlier. The emphasis changes completely. So, in the first, second case, he's, this the person is stable, so he can do the service. They had a the second point, second way it is. They had, a, they had problems in the past track record. Better don't give the service to me. So the emphasis can change completely by how we position something. So what Krishna is doing over here in the 18th chapter 1, first he says, if in 934 he is saying, if you in this way devote yourself to me, you will come to me. So it's like if two people want to make a deal, then first Krishna is saying, if you do your part, then you will come to me. Then I'll do my part. Whereas in 1865, he is saying, Ma He says that if you do this, I guarantee you, you will come to me because you are dear to me. So what is happening is, as the Bhagavad Gita is progressing, Krishna's compassion is overflowing more and more in his heart. And in a sense, in 934, he is saying, you do this, if you do this, I will do this. That is the point. But here he is saying, he is so eager that the deal be sealed. He said, if you do this, I guarantee you, I'll do my part. So Krishna's compassion is increasing. And therefore, when he says, Sarva Dharman Pratyajimame Kam Sharanam Prajan, that is not so much in the mood of an instruction as an as a expression of compassion. Don't be confused. I care for you very deeply. Therefore, just do what I'm telling you and I'll take care of everything else. So it's not so much a, uh, a, like a commandment as a, you could say, an exhortation. As a, as a call coming out from the heart. To one heart is speaking to another heart. So the point I'm making in here is that the Bhagavad Gita, when it talks about faith, uh, where, what is, it, what is it talking about? I, I started with this point of how the the mood of the Bhagavad Gita is not of commandments. I mean, there is some person up and they are giving instructions and everybody has to. Or Krishna is giving instruction and Arjuna has to obey. The mood is of a personal connection. Krishna and Arjun, Arjuna, by discussing the Bhagavad Gita, are developing a deep personal connection. And it's based on that personal connection that there is an exhortation that is coming. So when Krishna talks about Shraddha, this 
this call that you just forget everything else and surrender to me, that's definitely a call to faith. There's faith required. In one sense you could say, faith is in the heart. And faith is expressed through surrender. So surrender is faith in action. It's like if somebody says that, uh, somebody, the doctor says we have to do surgery. And the patient says, I have faith, but, but I can't do the surgery. Well, then, do you really have faith? So faith is inside, it's expressed through actions. And a particularly, because a climactic action of faith would be surrender. Now, this is, of course, the conclusion of the Gita. But the point I use this is to say that it's not so much commandment as it's a connection based on which there's exhortation coming over there. But if we go backwards, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the first canto, the second chapter is Divinity and Divine Service. And that is the one chapter from which the Prabhupada quotes the most in the Gita, in, in his various classes. Most verses he quotes from there. And there is a verse 1 to 12, where Krishna, where, where the Sutta Goswami is speaking about how the process of bhakti works. Tachvatadhano munaya, jnana vairagya yuktaya, pashyantyatmani chatmanam, bhaktya shudagruhitaya. So he says, Tachvatadhano munayo. In this way, those who are faithful, equipped with jnana and vairagya, knowledge and renunciation, they practice bhakti, bhaktya shudagruhitaya, as heard according to scripture. And by that, pashyantyatmani chatmanam. They see the inner self. They see the spiritual reality. Now, interestingly, in this verse, if you say Shraddha, what is the normal meaning of the word Shraddha? Faith. But Prabhupada, if the, the, in the translation, he says, the seriously inquisitive sage. So faith here if, is serious inquiry. And similarly, if we consider the nine stages of bhakti, one of the first is adau shraddha, sadhu sangha bhajana kriya. So, shraddha, if you look at the way Prabhupada translates it frequently, it is favorable curiosity. It is, maybe there is something out there. So, when somebody is living a materialistic life, then shraddha, faith would mean, maybe there is something out there. I want to find out. So, if we see another context is, we often say, human life begins with inquiry. Atato, jikyasa. So it's not a call for having faith as a call for making inquiry. Brahma jikyasa is spiritual inquiry. And even when we make an inquiry, we could say that there is some amount of faith over there. If, if we ask a question to someone, then we ask that question because we have some faith that this person probably knows more than me and they can answer the question. But it's, it's not that we are simply accepting whatever that person is saying. So the curiosity is the first level of faith. When Krishna, when Adav Shraddha Sadhu Sang, so it's Shraddha, the beginning of spiritual journey is curiosity. Curiosity that Maybe there is something more. We are living a day-to-day -day life where we are pursuing our, <coughs> our bodily needs and our various desires. But maybe there is something more to life. If there is, what is it? That inquiry is what the, what the Vedanta Sutra calls for. So here also, faith is not in that there is somebody up there, you with him. Faith is that maybe there is something more to life. Let's try to find out more about it. So this idea of faith as curiosity is something which can always keep us moving in our lives. So now, if, if there are the five stages, does anyone know the stages of devotion as given Bhakta Samuel Sindhu? Shraddha is the first stage. Does anyone know how it moves on? Yes, please. Sadhu Sangha. What is that? Association of devotees. Yes. Is there something out there? 
maybe and I have inquiry, whom do I inquire it from? I go to those who are practicing, those who are like devotees, sadhu sangha. And then what happens? Anyone else? Bhajana kriya, yeah, thank Bhajana kriya means, now, spiritual life is not just about gaining knowledge. It's about gaining experience. And experience comes when we practice something. So, without practice, whatever we know is like, it's okay, it's there, but we really don't know about it. Uh, with just reading books on spiritual knowledge and hoping to get spiritual realization is like reading books on weight loss and hoping to lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we need to read the, if you want to read, but after that, after that you don't apply. <laughs> you don't apply, it's not going to happen. So then, Bhajana Kriya is actually applying. It's a practice of devotional service. And then what happens when Bhajana Kriya is done? Anarthanurutti, yes. So, Anarthanurutti is where the unwanted cravings in our heart start going down. So, it can be greed, it can be envy, it can be anger. All these things start going down. And it's interesting, the, the, the stage that comes after this, what is it? Nishtha, yes. Nishtha and Shraddha have similar connotations. But Nishtha is very deep faith. It is, it is, you could say, Shraddha, in the first stage here is curiosity. That is the first level faith. Then this is conviction. where we have experienced the result, at least to some extent. The Acharyas give the example that this is like a banana tree. And this is like a banyan tree. What is the difference between the banana tree and a banyan tree? <laughs> Sorry? Banyan tree has very thick roots. Banana tree is just, is anybody can go and just shake it. A banyan tree, you know, people will shake, but the tree will not shake. It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens at this stage, when we have experienced at least some transformation, we have experienced some transformation, and thereafter, uh, what has happened? works. It may not work fully. Whether it works fully, we don't know. But at least to some extent, it doesn't work. So this, again, it's faith, but it's not, oh, there is someone up there and I have to follow. It's just that I have experienced something. I have experienced, not just necessarily some, some I saw some light or experienced some peace. All that is good if you have experienced. But the important thing is our, that there is spiritual experience and there is spiritual state. Spiritual experiences will come and go. Sometimes we feel very good. Sometimes when we are chanting, uh, we just feel so, so connected with Krishna, such strength, such power, that we feel like chanting should never end. Most days, however, we feel chanting never ends. <laughs> it just seems to go on and on and on. So, Spiritual experiences may come and they may go. But you are talking about spiritual state. What do I mean by spiritual state? It's more a state of consciousness. It's basically, we have, <clears throat> how much are we attracted towards spiritual reality and how much are we attracted towards material reality. So the material, material attachments, the material passions, they decrease. And as we experience the conviction. So I had two friends. Both of them are quite interested in medicine. So one of them is a DIY allopath. 
He's a, he has a lot of faith in allopathy. And he reads a lot of books and how to do, treat this, how to treat that. And another is a homeopath. And homeopathy is often considered by Western science, Western science to be like a, uh, a quack medicine. It is nothing except uh, it is nothing except sugar pills being given. And if any cure is happening, it's simply placebo. There is no cure actually at all. And there are they're quite uh, they often consider this homeopathy to be a whole like a racket. But now, but this this other friend, he says that for years I have been I I had a he had some issue, intestinal issue and said I took allopathy treatment didn't work. I took homeopathy treatment for three months, it's fully gone. So what for, for him, because he has been cured, even if somebody else says this doesn't work, it is somebody who says this medicine is wrong. I mean, medicine is wrong, but the patient is cured. How does that work? <laughs> so that means where we if we have come to the level of conviction. Here we have experienced the transformation. And even if somebody argues, somebody, oh, this is not right, that is not right, this is bad, that is bad. Okay, we may not have refutations for that. But just because we don't have refutation for something doesn't mean we don't have conviction. I don't know how to refute this person, but this has worked for me. So the conviction comes because of the personal transformation that you have experienced. So the process of Krishna consciousness is essentially a process of transformation, of progressive transformation. And to the extent we are being transformed, to that extent our faith increases. So <clears throat> I talked till now about this point of faith as the whole mood is not that commandments are given and commandments are to be obeyed, rather curiosity is triggered. And by that we, ex we start a process that will bring about a transformation. And when this transformation happens, then at least to some level, then we experience conviction. And that conviction is a deepened stage of faith. So any questions or comments till now? Yes, please. Okay, that's a good question. Mm, I wouldn't put it that bluntly. Okay. So is there a what is the difference between spiritual state and spiritual experiences? Okay. So you say that if we consider say something like a mountain this is material consciousness I'm writing with my process here okay this is spiritual consciousness so we are going up this journey so while we are going up our consciousness may sometime peak up like this for a few moments Sometimes, even when we are not practicing bhakti very seriously, or we are not at a very advanced level, but our consciousness sometimes surges up, like a wave. And sometimes we experience certain things which we would not normally experience. Sometimes we say we experience very deep ecstasy. Sometimes we, if we feel, say some beautiful darshan of Krishna is there, some very sweet kirtan is there. Sometimes we have some very warm interaction with some devotees, uh, some senior devotees, and we feel deeply uplifted. So that's a spiritual experience. So when you talk about spiritual experience, it is there for some time and then it goes. But when I'm talking about spiritual state, it's like say we were here and we had a spiritual experience. But now from here, we have moved up to here. So here, this is the level where we are at steady. Now from here also we might have a spiritual search. But experience is something which comes and goes. Whereas state is more a matter of overall incarnation. Prabhupada in the two, two 
270 per board. 270 is Apu Riman Machala Pravishtam. Samudra Mapa Pravishtam Diyadvad. Tadvad Kamayam Pravishtam Disarve. Sashanti Map Noti Nakama Kami. So then that purport he says that when he gives the example of the verse of ocean. This is reverse flow into an ocean. Similarly, desires may flow into the consciousness of a self-realized person. But those desires don't trouble the person. So there Prabhupada talks about the difference between desire and inclination. So this is a very interesting concept. So if you consider this to be like the consciousness of a person, that's like an ocean. So normally we think of desires as going out. Normally you think say, this is some sense object over here. So the person is here, the desire normally goes out. We see something, I want it. That's, that's how we normally conceive of desires. But the Sanskrit word is very interesting. Na kama kami. Na kama kami means not a desirer of desire. So I'll explain what that means. Now, in the, the example is what? If you consider this to be like an ocean, the example is rivers flowing into that ocean do not disturb the person. So what this means is, that when some, so the, the, the idea is desire flowing in, not flowing out. So what it means is that whenever any attractive object is seen, now when the attractive object is seen, that perception will enter into our visual channel or our oral channel, whichever sense object it is. Now when that happens, in that, so this can also be called a desire, this can also be called a desire at one level. So, na kama kami means not, but who is not the desirer of desire. That means the desire flows in, but the person is, I'm not interested. So it's like, say, if we are fasting on Ekadashi and somebody offers us some delicious food, maybe a delicious pizza. But Ekadashi, no. Maybe tomorrow I'll eat. So it's not that, it's not that it's not attractive. But the inclination to take that is not there. So that's the difference between desire and inclination. So Prabhupada uses the word inclination in terms of this flowing out. So when we see something attractive, a certain level of attraction coming within us is fine. It's, it's just a, not fine, it's, an, it's just unavoidable. It's just natural. Say, even on Ekadashi, if we have some favorite item, and we see that, you know, our mouth may water. And we cannot uh, legislate our mouth and say you should not water. <laughs> but we can decide, I'm not going to eat this. So the difference is that when, when earlier I said about spiritual state means that the consciousness overall is elevated so that even if desires come, there is no inclination to fulfill the desire. So the, so the overall orientation of the consciousness is towards Krishna, not towards the world. The spiritual state would be, you could say, more like a steady state of consciousness. Now, even within the steady state, waves will be there. But if we look at, say, ourselves 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and we look at ourselves now, the steady state will be significantly different. Maybe at that time our steady state was, how can I get more sensual pleasures? Now my steady state is, how can I minimize sensual desires? How can I minimize sensual indulgences? So in that sense, the state is the overall level, overall inclination of our consciousness that is more in the spiritual direction. So spiritual, spiritual experiences are like upward surges in the consciousness, whereas you could say sensual urges are like downward surges. But there is an overall level of consciousness. Does that make sense to you? Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Okay, so 
how can we remember always that what we are doing is a personal choice? Because sometimes we, if we are living in the ashram, we do something because others are telling us to do it, or because it's the expected standard, or yeah, there could be various levels. See, so this is maybe a whole sub. I have a full class on this topic, but I'll just mention a few quick points. If there is. Uh, there is, there can be always a difference between our internal emotion and our external action. Now, sorry. when this difference is there, why is this difference there is important? So, at one level, if I consider this difference between the two, this distance that is there, this distance, it could be, you could take at the extreme level, it could be because of hypocrisy. That means, somebody just has, somebody wants, say, the prestige from a particular post. Like in India, we have our, one of the biggest, most beautiful temples, the temple in Juhu, which the Prabhupada himself constructed. So, that is right in the area uh, where India's film industry is there, is Bollywood. So especially in Janmashtami, many Bollywood stars, they come to the temple. And now of course we don't know what is in their heart. But quite often they come there and after that they go and put their photo on Facebook or Instagram that I have visited, uh, visited the Krishna temple, Hare Krishna temple in Janmashtami. And people write, oh you're such a nice person, you're so famous, you're such a star which you go to the temple. Now when they are going to the temple, are they going to take darshan or are they going to give darshan? <laughs> are they going to see the Lord or to, wish to show to the world that I went to the temple? Now somebody has, has, has no devotion, no inclination for devotion and that person just goes to a temple so that they will look good in people's eyes. So that would be hypocrisy. Where the inner and outer distance is simply for a show. Mm -hmm. But this need not be the only thing. There can be various levels. Now, this internal external difference, it can also be because of discipline. Discipline means, you know, I really want to do this but I don't feel like doing it. And that is required in every walk of life. Uh, even the things that we like to do, our mind is such that it won't like it, it won't like them all the time. Even the things we like to do. So it's um, again I can use some examples from writing. Uh, I sometimes get so absorbed in the writing. There are sometimes and I just look at the computer and nothing seems to be coming in my head. So I read a quote by an author, he says, writing is very easy. You just glare at the computer screen till drops of blood form on your forehead. <laughs> 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 so now, there are authors who may, they want to write but nothing is coming. But still, said, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to type something. So that's discipline. Where we want to do something, but our emotions are not accompanying our intention of that. So that this is, this is a discipline. Now here another one could be, you could have as you rightly said, deference. Deference means out of respect. Respect for someone, or respect for some cultural norm, respect for some tradition. That uh, this is the way to behave in a particular situation. So this, uh, this is also, it's quite okay. Say, sometimes we might be angry with someone. But, you know, if they are older to us, then we still might speak respectfully. So this is, this, this is also part of culture. And, in a sense, actually, we can't see each other's thoughts, desires, emotions. And that's a great blessing. <laughs> if we started seeing each other's thoughts, desires, you think like this about me? 
<laughs> this kind of desires. <laughs> Not a single relationship could be sustained. <laughs> so, you could say nature has given us a buffer <laughs> by which certain things may come up within us, but we restrain ourselves. So that can be out of discipline, that can be out of difference. And if it is for either of these, this is just a normal way of, you could say, civilized behavior or purification. Reference would be, in culture and society, there's a particular respectable way in which you behave. So this is, this is fine, discipline is even better. This could be ritualistic also. Not, there's a difference between being ritualistic and being hypocritical. Ritualistic is, I, I don't have faith in this, or I don't really care much about it. But it's not what everyone does, so I do it. But the hypocrisy is where, I don't want to do it, but I want to get the respect, the prestige out of doing it. So discipline is, and discipline is even better. Because I, I want to get this emotion. I want to get have this consciousness, but I don't have it, let me do the action. So Prabhupada told the Buddha that if you are if Kirtan is going on, you don't feel like dancing, still dance. And as you dance, the bhava will come, the emotion will come. And gradually, what will happen is the internal and the external will become one. But it will take a long time. And even for somebody who is pure, still it is not that not necessary that if, that all the things that they do, they love those things equally. Even for a pure devotee, there are some things they may look forward to. Sometimes they also do the responsibility. But that will not, they will not look forward to. So now with respect to having said this difference between internal emotion and external action, there could also be something else going on that sometimes there might be a lot of incompatibility. You know, I'm doing this particular service, but it just doesn't work. So then what do we do? Then it's important still to do it as a discipline. Because what happens, our moods keep going up and down. If we ask our mind, what, what is my nature? What is the service according to my nature? The mind will give a ready answer. Whatever you are doing right now, that is not your nature. <laughs> <laughs> so, the mind is expert at keeping us dissatisfied. So whatever we do, we might feel dissatisfied. But if instead of just a occasion, just a fleeting emotion that is coming and going, if repeatedly we are having that same frame of mind, that same kind of incompatibility, same kind of discomfort, then we may decide, okay, maybe this is not the exact way I can conduct myself. Then we may need to do some adjustments. Does that address your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Any comments? Okay, so now I talked about faith as curiosity and then faith as conviction. I was talking about that. So now when we practice the process of Krishna consciousness, what is the result that we expect from it? What do you think? When you're practicing Krishna consciousness, what is the result that we expect? Bliss. Sorry? Bliss. 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 Sorry. Okay, bliss. Okay. Yes, that could be one answer. Bliss. Any other answers? Relationship with Krishna, yeah, that's true. Bliss, the relationship with Krishna. Okay. Freedom from material desires. Anything else? Yes, please. Service opportunities. Service opportunities. That's quite a Service-minded answer. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> Service opportunities. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, sorry. Mm, to develop love for Krishna. Okay, relationship with Krishna, love for Krishna. Okay. 
Now I ask you one question. What do we realistically expect? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all of us have been practicing Krishna consciousness maybe for few years, maybe few decades. Now, these are all certainly our aspirations. And we, we do want to develop this. But what can we realistically expect? Or what, let's put it this way, uh, what have we Re, what have we achieved till now, based on which we can have further expectations. So, we could say to some extent, now have, have we achieved any of these? Yes? Uh, relief from suffering. Relief from suffering. Yes. What, what, what kind of suffering are you talking about? In general. Okay, that's a good point. Relief from suffering. Now, if you see this, and when I ask this question, what can we realistically achieve? I would say that these are not just like a state. We could say it's like a continuum or a spectrum. And in this spectrum, we can say now freedom from material desires. Uh, we may not be free from material desires, but if we consider a certain gross material desires from which we are definitely free. If uh, we can say, as compared to how many material desires we have, definitely they are less enough. As compared to a relationship with Krishna, what kind of relationship we had earlier? We didn't even care about God. <laughs> one, of my, one of my relatives, when I started practicing bhakti, I was talking with him about God's existence. God's existence. He said, yeah, yeah, I believe God exists. He is happy there, I am happy here. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> that's not much of a relationship. <laughs> so, suddenly, if we consider all of these, we are progressing in that direction. We develop relationship, we have developed at least some relationship with Krishna. Now, as far as bliss, surely some, some, some experiences of joy we do have. Then, similarly, service opportunities, as compared to what we had earlier, we do have more of these. So this is the key that Krishna Consciousness is it's not so much digital as it is analog. Digital is like a one or zero. Either we are here or we are not here. Whereas Krishna Consciousness is more like an analog progression. It is we are moving along. It's like if you have an analog watch, it's gradually the hand is moving. So like that, Krishna Consciousness, we move gradually. But sometimes we have this conception of Krishna Consciousness as all or nothing. Either I am Krishna Conscious or I am in Maya. I am an illusion. Now we could say at a moment to moment basis, yes, sometimes we can say that, oh, now I am not Krishna Consciousness. Now let me try to be Krishna Conscious. That's possible, that's true. But overall, it's like analog. It's a gradual progression. And this, this idea of, a, uh, of a analog progression is what Krishna stresses in the Bhagavad Gita in the 12th chapter. When he talks about how there are multiple levels at which we can connect with him. In 12th chapter, 8th verse, first he says that, just absorb yourself in me. With your, keep your mind and intelligence absorbed in me. In this way, you will live in me. So we could say that this is a ladder of love which Krishna is extending from a very high level to various levels. This is 12, 8 to 12. 12 chapter 8 was 12 verse. So top level is this spontaneous absorption in Krishna. Then the next level he says is somebody says I can't do this. Then he says Atachitam samadhatam nishakno si maistiram abhyasa yogi nidato mami chaptam then anjaya he says, then, trying to fix your mind. So we could call that as 
conscientious absorption. So spontaneous is just naturally our heart is attracted towards Krishna. Just we love Krishna, so we're naturally thinking about, naturally absorbing him. But conscientious means our mind may wander, but we get it back, focus. We strive to fix the mind. So Krishna says, if you can't be at this level, be at this level. But then he says, if you can't do this, then he says, if you can't absorb yourself in me, work for me. That means, he's saying that, you can, this is partially an answer to your question also again, that here Krishna says, even if you can't fix your mind on me, just work for me. That means, if you can't be internally connected with me, at least be externally connected. So the idea is we talk about devotional service. So generally, if there's a, like, there's a compound phrase, there is an adjective and there is a noun. So this devotional is the adjective, service is the noun. So the idea is what we want to do is devotional service. But even if we don't feel devotional, we can still do the service. And gradually, the devotional feeling will come. So Krishna says, work for me. He extends downward and then he says, if you can't do this also, then Abhyasi Pasamar Sumat Karma Paramoham Adartham Karmani Kurvan Siddhima Vapsesi. He says, Atahita Dabhya Sattosi Kartu Madhyoga Vashita Sarva Karma Palatyagata Tapakuru Yata Atmavan. So he says, then work for some good cause. Broadly he is saying, just be selfless. Just to be progress. That means, even if you can't work for me, just work for some cause bigger than yourself. So we could say this is a journey in spiritual evolution. And then he goes further down, there's some technical points over there, I won't go into this. This is indicative that Krishna is giving us abundant room for practicing Krishna consciousness. And with the process of Krishna consciousness, is not this level or get out. It is, if not this level, then this level. If not this level, then this level. If not this level, then this level. And in that way, we could say that Krishna consciousness is more. Like I talked about the mountain. Another example which you could use the pyramid. Somebody could, now at the top of the pyramid, the circle will be small. At the bottom of the pyramid, the circle will be big. So when there's a pyramid, at that point, somebody near the top of the pyramid, they might be where they're, they're spontaneously absorbing Krishna. But somebody at the bottom of the pyramid might just come, okay, I'll come to the temple, I'll come to some center, I'll just do some service, I'll do some volunteer work, I want to do some, I want to contribute to some good cause. And they are also connected with Krishna. So Krishna offers us multiple levels at which we can connect with him. And uh, how is this related with faith again? The point is that if we consider there is there are two aspects in our relationship with our spiritual master, the spiritual guide, or with Krishna. If we consider the example of Dhruva Maharaj, it's a very interesting story with many aspects, but let me focus on one particular aspect. So Dhruva is just a small five-year-old boy and he is insulted. Actually, he's not even directly insulted. He is at his, he just, his father is sitting in his palace and his brother Uttama is sitting on his father's lap. And he sees that and he runs there and wants to sit on his father's lap. And as he starts to climb on his father's lap, his stepmother is there. What is her name? Does anyone know? Suruchi. Suruchi, yes. So now it's interesting. Ruchi, what is his mother's name? Sumiti. So Suruchi is one for whom one who is Ruchi, attractive. So her, so Dhruva's father is attracted more to her. But Suniti, Niti is morality, is virtue. So his ma so his stepmother is maybe more attractive, but his mother is more virtuous. So what happens? Suruchi is over there. 
And she says, she doesn't let Dhruva climb on her father's lap. Yes. If you are to climb on your father's lap, you have to take birth from my womb. Otherwise, you can't climb. But when this happens, Dhruva is angry, he's hurt. The children are often very tender. I mean, small, small acts of uh, acts of rejection can be very painful. Because why children, for children, their area of control is very small. And when something goes wrong in that area, then when his stepmother spoke like this, he turned to his father. His father also remained silent. And that hurt him even more. Often, when we say there's some quarrel, we all have our critics, our enemies, we could say. So that the harshest words of our enemies don't hurt us as much as the silence of our friends. Our enemies, we expect them. That that's what they want to do. Those who are against us. Those who we expect to support us, if they remain silent, that can hurt us enormously. So Dhruva felt terribly hurt. Crying, he ran out of this. As a child, what shelter does he have? He ran to his mother. His mother, uh, a maid was there, she had already run and told what had happened. So his mother hugged him and tried to console him. But she, she was also powerless. So she told him, he says, my father did not allow me to sit on his lap. He says, I will sit not only on the lap, I will sit on the throne. And not only on the throne, I will sit on a throne bigger than his, own, bigger than his throne. I will occupy a kingdom bigger than his kingdom and I will sit in a bigger throne. How can I do this? Now, his mother, she, she saw that this child is very determined and she said, it's only one person who can help you. Who is that? Vishnu, the Lord. Okay, where do I find the Lord? Now, you imagine a five-year-old child, mother telling him, in the forest. You know, today if such a mother would be, you know, punished probably by the <laughs> government services <laughs> for like, abandonment of child or for neglection of duty. <laughs> he said, go to the forest. Still can find him in the forest. And he immediately left. Now when he left over there, at that time, we could say that he was very angry, he was very upset. And uh, there is uh, there is one person in the bhakti literature who is who is almost omnipresent. Who is that? Narad Muni. Yeah. <laughs> so Narad Muni is sometimes seen as a troublemaker. <laughs> it's like when Kamsa has decided that Kamsa, what happens is he hears comes to know that oh, Devaki's eighth son is going to kill me. Then. To save Devaki, the father says, uh, Vasudeva says that, I'll give all my sons. So when he goes and gives the first son, Kamsa says, actually there's no need to give the first son. Only the eight sons are threatened. So then, Narada comes over there. And Narada throws a lot of flower to him. Says what? With how many petals are there? Yes? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight petals. Okay, which of them is the first and which of them is the eighth? <laughs> what do you mean? He says, which child is the eighth child? Oh, and then he goes back and he grabs that child also. So now why does Narada do like this? The idea of Narada is that he wants Krishna to appear as quickly as possible. So. You know, if they have a child and this child is growing, they are in the prison, they don't have much facilities to take care of children. So, then... <laughs> so, they may not have another child immediately. So then, he just has... So he accelerates. Sometimes he may provoke people. So, but he's actually... He's not a troublemaker, he's a trouble He just... Krishna tells him where to go and what to do. So there, in the Bhagavatam, there's very interesting words. When Narada hears that Dhruva 
has been has gone to the forest. He says, "Aho kshatriya tejasa man bhangam amrushita." He says, "Just see how glorious is the prowess of the kshatriyas that they cannot tolerate dishonor." Man bhangam amrushita. Now we say, "Oh, sign of a devotee is tolerate dishonor." Tolerate amani na. Manina, just tolerate this. So, I was in a temple, and many devotees had a had a lot of complaint about the local authority over there. And he said, "Though he he speaks very harshly to us, he just he just uses terrible language. He criticizes us in public." Then, uh, then I was talking with him. And I express this to him. He says, "Of course. Otherwise, how will they learn humility?" Now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is not the way to teach humility. This is the difference between humility and humiliation. <laughs> humiliation only alienates people. Alienates people from the person who is doing it, and alienates them from Krishna because you are representing Krishna. Humility is where we consciously shift our focus to mm, I, me, and my respect is not that important. It is Krishna is important. So humility is actually to be cultivated more by conscious choice, and it is to be inspired by one's actions. When we see somebody who is saying they are humble, then we also feel inspired to be humble. But humiliating people is not the way to develop humility. So the point I am making over here is that. That he was humiliated, and he couldn't tolerate it. So the point he, Narada is appreciating is that Kshatriyas they have very deep sense of honor, and that sense of honor enables them to behave honorably. If somebody has a sense of honor, so we could have three different words. We could have pride, we can have honor, and we can have arrogance. Now the word pride often we use it as a negative sense, like lust, anger, greed, and deep pride. It's one of the anarthas, but that's not always the way in which it is used. There are people who, you know, I will play for pride, I will fight for pride, or you can have the names of the I saw name of hotel, hotel executive pride or hotel pride. I have not seen any name of a hotel called hotel arrogance. <laughs> So arrogance is considered to be you could, if you want to have a, a spectrum, arrogance is on the negative side. Nobody likes arrogant people. Mm -hmm. But honor is something which is important. There is a letter of Shri Prabhupada like where a devotee, after taking initiation, is not practicing the vows. So Prabhupada writes to him. He says, "You took the vow in front of the spiritual master, in front of the deities, in front of sacred fire. How can you not follow the vow? Don't you have a sense of honor?" So a sense of honor here means that that when we respect ourselves and we respect our word and take that word seriously. So now for Kshatriyas, it's the sense of honor is very important because they have a lot of power, and if they give a word of honor, they will surely honor it. If that sense of honor, so it's, here sense of honor is not in the sense that I am so great, but rather it is that I will behave in an honorable way. Is in that sense. So the point I'm making is that we could say Dhruva was insulted, but but he, out of that insult, decided to go to the forest and seek God. And Narada is appreciating that. I'll what is the significance of that appreciation? I'll come to that a little later. But then Narada comes in, and the big way of Narada is of of Dhruva. He asks, "What are you doing? Where are you going?" And he says, "I'm going to find Vishnu." He says, "What happened?" And tells what happened. He says, "Oh, he says, you are just a child. He says, children while playing, they just uh, just quarrel with each other. Sometimes fight with each other. With each other. Now sometimes children when they are playing, they may just fight and yell, and they might just have some. They then small fists or they beat each other. And the adults might get very agitated. And what is happening?" And after five minutes, both of them are forgotten. Both of them play nicely. Mm -hmm. So among children, it just goes on. 
just uh, children don't take their ups and downs very seriously. So, if say you're a child, don't take this seriously. And if you think you're an adult, then those who are mature, they don't take honor and dishonor so seriously. So just go back home. Now, none of this one bit catching if you're a if you're a inf- if you're a child, if you're an adult. Both ways he says, go back. And what the Guru says, he says, the instruction, the words you have spoken are very wise. But I cannot apply them. Since I have been very hurt and I need some solution. I need to find Vishnu. Please tell me how I can find Vishnu or let me go on my way. So then when the Guru speaks this, Another way of teaching is okay, I tell you. And then he tells him how to worship Krishna. So here, what is happening is, Narayana gives instruction at a particular level. Dhruva says, I cannot follow it. And he's not disrespectful, but he is candid. And then, Narayana gives instruction appropriately. So here, what we see is negotiation. There is submission, but there is also negotiation. Yes, I respect your authority, but I can't do this. So, that negotiation is what is often required. Because ultimately, whatever is to be done, if somebody is giving us an instruction, it is we who have to follow it. Nobody else is going to follow it. And if if our heart is not in it, if we are not convinced about it, or if we feel I can't do it, then we will just drag our feet along. We will just drag our feet along. I was talking with a doctor recently. He told me that he's a, he's a kidney transplant specialist. And he said that it's almost like whenever, whenever a person is sick, at that time, people often don't if they get some prescription drug, don't take this, take this, take this, almost 50 to 70 percent people don't take the prescription drug. Now I had I had severe TB about 15 years ago, and a doctor told me, he like, told me like three, four, five times. He said that, that if he gave me treatment for almost one year, and he told me after three months, your symptoms will go away and you will feel healthy. But don't stop the treatment. Because the germs are still there. And if the TB resurfaces, then it's called RDB, resistant TB. And treating that is always extremely, 100 times more complicated. So, the, so because he grounded in me so much, then I took the treatment for the whole course. But he was telling, this doctor was telling me that and so many people, they don't just take the treatment. Because, because they're not themselves convinced about it. So after the symptoms subside, they don't take it. In fact, he says, with respect to liver transplant, people have to do dialysis. It's a very messy process before if they don't get the, sorry, kidney, kidney transplant, not liver. So, if they, they have to do dialysis, it's very, very complicated. You have to get the whole blood out of the body and then again put it in. It takes hours and hours. So now, if it's quite complicated and people do it. And after, some time, after years of waiting, they get a kidney. Uh, they get, when they get a kidney, then the body often rejects anything foreign that is inserted in the body. So then, for countering that rejection, some medicine is to be done. And if that medicine is not, that medicine curbs the rejection, rejection, the, enzy- the WBCs that are fighting the kidney that is inserted. So when those, those anti-rejection drugs are not taken, then the body is immune system itself destroys the kidney. And now, people have done dialysis for months and months, waited for years to get a kidney. And after they get the kidney, then they don't take the medicines. I said, how can anyone be so careless? But it's interesting, when you survey that, it's like almost 50% of people don't take the medicine that they're prescribed. But if somebody has a pet and they take a pet to a doctor, it's like almost 90% of people make sure their pet takes the medicine. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 
it's so ironical and the point i'm making over here is that just because something is prescribed if somebody is not convinced that this is going to work or this is important i need to do this they will not do it so that's why there's one level submission is required but another level negotiation is also required so negotiation is i can do it if somebody thinks this is too messy i can't do it then if you can't do it then either you have to be convinced why it is important and you have to take it's messy but you need to do it or if it's too messy i can't do it then give some other level of treatment which will work so if we don't take the treatment at all then we worsen the situation worsen the um, and worsen the treatment and there are there, in some treatments there are levels of treatment okay you can take this medicine or you can take this level there are different levels of treatment also so bhakti is more like that if you can't take this level it is not of much use if we say i'll take it at this level and then we don't take it at that level. so there is negotiation narmuni is also expert spiritual guide who does not impose his instruction so i told you obey this no he says if you can't do this then do this so this negotiation is where faith is also required now what is the faith over here the faith is that what i am told to do can i do it or i can't do it now if he has been very hurt dhru has been very very hurt by the insult that is happening so if he is told that okay everything is this forget it it doesn't work because at that point the wound is too deep inside so one of the most frustrating aspects for of for a devotee sometimes is that a devotee has a practical problem and the devotee is given a philosophical solution <laughs> yeah practical problem hey come on you know it's winter and uh, there is no heater over there it's very cold it's chandra rishi <laughs> wow <laughs> okay at that time we can chant and tolerate it but there is a practical solution which is required so what happens now we may we may say that we, we could take it at various levels if if say somebody is doing kirtan and the loudspeaker is not working then if this keep the kirtan singer says you know the loudspeaker is not working chant hari krishna and you well okay you can chant hari krishna but then we have to chant hari krishna and we have to fix the mic also so there is some for some in some situations some material things need to be fixed and faith means this the the this is in sanskrit there is another word called word called adhikar now this is what adhikar means it level so our faith shraddha is very much related to adhikar that means the level we are which we are at that will determine how much faith we have or the level we are at accordingly we will be able to practice something so if somebody who is very new to krishna consciousness and what happens sometimes uh, devotees is start telling them you know what do you people do no meditate no intoxication no gambling no illicit sex i was at a retreat i had arranged a retreat uh, for at for western devotees in america at her, at her place now what happens is this 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 entire new people when we call them we didn't even tell it's a temple we just give the address and the temple hall structure was such that that the temple structure such that they could come into the temple and they cross a hall and then they go to temple hall and upstairs was the seminar room so they all came upstairs we did not take them to temple or because they were completely new american people so then i gradually was talking about fate destiny and free will and bringing various concepts slowly as building something and then for one session i was not there because i had to go somewhere else to a uh, to another place for a the theosophical society over there to give a talk so at that time they had another devotee give a cooking class and he was supposed to about one and a half hours he was supposed to uh, teach various cooking and in that one and a half hours it like one hour 15 minutes became a class and 15 minutes was cooking and that class was a, like a 
complete dose of Krishna consciousness. He says, you know, no meat eating, no onion garlic also. Wake up at 4.30 in the morning. And this, 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 you know. And no illicit sex, this, that. It was, at the end of it, all the people, yad gatwan and ivartakti, they go away never to come back. It became like that. It's like, I mean, have to spend, the last session was almost like, like undoing all the damage that he had done. So then I was talking with that preacher and he said that, actually, these people are never likely to come again. So at least once let them hear the full Krishna consciousness. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, if you give them the full Krishna consciousness, how is it like, it's like, Suppose, say suppose somebody is promoting a new phone, say uh, a new version of iPhone has come, is it iPhone X or something now? Whatever it is, iPhone X. Say. So a new phone has come. Now does any promotion of a phone begin with the price? Thousand dollars, twelve hundred dollars, fifteen hundred dollars. Now all the promotion begins with Features. Oh, this is so fast, the screen is so good, this is this processor is so fast, this is so smooth, so light. And then in the in the microscope you will see the price. <laughs> see it? Now obviously the price has to be paid. But first you will tell people what are the features and then let the price come. Now if somebody instead is very proud. I bought an iPhone. And then say, you know, how, what is the cost of the iPhone? iPhone is $1,500. And now, when they are telling like that, they simply want to attract the admiration or maybe even the envy of others. Say, ah, it's such an expensive phone. So now that is a very different purpose. Then, if somebody wants to actually sell an iPhone, get others to buy an iPhone. So in any kind of promotion, first we tell the features, first we tell the benefits, and then we tell the price. But unfortunately what we do is, we often just tell the price, and we are proud of the price. This is the price I am paying. And this is the price you also should pay. <laughs> and if you are not paying this, then you are, you are going to go to hell. It's, it's, we may not be, I am a little caricature, but uh, it was just like that over there. So, what happens is that people have a particular level of adhikar. Adhikar means what is their level right now. And we are talking about people, it's not just new people. As devotees also, we also have a particular level of, a uh, particular level at which you can practice Bhakti. So understanding the level and giving accordingly to them, that is very important. So when, going back to the earliest Dhruva story, and he says that he cannot tolerate, Dhruva says, I cannot tolerate this pain. So then, Narayana says, okay, you can't tolerate it, fine, I'll give you a remedy. Now somebody else, if somebody in the Brahman or somebody is okay, somebody is insulted, what's the big deal? Forget it. So, each person is an individual. And what might be easy to tolerate for one person might be very difficult to tolerate for somebody else. So, we cannot have one instruction applied for everyone. So, adhikar is the level the person is at and accordingly the instruction needs to be given so that the person can apply the instruction. So, both from the giver of the instruction from the receiver of the instruction. There has to be a certain amount of uh, candid discussion. I can't do this. Okay, if you can't do this, that doesn't mean that person is unsubmissive or rebellious. Okay, then what, 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 what is the reason you feel you can't do it? What, you, what, what can you do? Can you do this? So basically, this idea of negotiation is important because if we don't have that idea, if we think, yes, whatever I'm told, I'll do it. That attitude is good at one level in terms of submission. But is it sustainable? Bhakti has to be performed Preeti Purvaka. Preeti Purvaka means 
Devotion has to be performed with affection. Sometimes we are told to do something and we don't want to do it at all. And we do it with our heart filled with resentment. Why do I have to do this? Now, if that is constantly there in our hearts, then we will not be able to, if our heart is filled with resentment, how will Krishna come in the heart? So there has to be this negotiation to understand what is the level at which a person can practice bhakti sustainably. So there is there are two important factors in balancing this and I will then we can have some questions. That there is if you could consider like a weighing balance on one side is intensity and the other side is sustainability. So both are important. If you focus only on intensity, say for example, Ekadashi, when you fast on Ekadashi, that's intensity. But if somebody does fast on Ekadashi, you fasted yesterday, very good. Now let's fast the whole week. <laughs> hey, I can't do that. <laughs> So intensity is fine, but is, it, is there sustainability also? So both of these need to be balanced. Sometimes we focus only on intensity, then we do for some time, but then afterwards it's just, when we can't do it, if we have this attitude of uh, all or nothing in Krishna consciousness, we do all for some time, and then after that, we do nothing. There was a disciple of Shri Prabhupada, he went once to Vrindavan and there he met some Babaji who was chanting, chanting something like uh, a lot of rounds. Maybe every day he was chanting 108 rounds or something like that. And he said, I also want to chant like that. And he told Prabhupada that, Prabhupada, actually I want to build a small house on top of a tree in Vrindavan. And I will live in the tree house and I will chant. And Prabhupada said, no. He said, this chance 16 rounds and do service. He says, no, no, I will advance rapidly. And then he just went and he started doing that. So he was 108 rounds. Then after some days he said, I'm chanting 128 rounds now. And then he increased further. I'm chanting 164 rounds. And after that, he was going to get disappeared. And what happened? And then they found that uh, near Vrindavan, he was working at a petrol, at a gas station. That's what happened. He says, I have chanted enough for this lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there's intensity, but there's no sustainability. So we need a balance of both. We, if we try only for intensity, which is good, but if there's no sustainability, then we will oscillate. It's like one of the stages in uh, in Anarthani Vritti is called Ghanatarla. Ghanatarla means sometimes we are very intense and sometimes we are very loose. But we need steadiness. So we have to find out what is the level at which we can sustainably practice bhakti. And faith means, in this context, understanding that bhakti will work for me also. Even if I practice at this level, okay, it might be a little slower, but it will work. So, any questions till now? There's one thing which I was planning to take tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about the, the balance between self-discipline and self-discovery in bhakti. How much do we discipline ourselves and how much do we discover ourselves in our um, spiritual practices. Uh, but at this point, any, uh, sorry, what I spoke in the second part before the question asked was that I talked about how when we are practicing bhakti, I talked about the story and there was not just submission but there was negotiation. And the idea of negotiation is unless there is there is the conviction about the capacity to practice a particular level, we might pretend to practice and not actually practice or we might just resent while practicing and then give it up. So we have to find out what is the level at which we can sustainably practice. I talked about this treatment which was lost. 
the, which the people even get liver, uh, kidney transplant and they don't take the medication. So if we do that, then we won't be able to continue. We won't get the benefit. So faith means recognizing that we all have a particular adhikar, a particular level. And Krishna also offers multi-level bhakti, spontaneous absorption, conscientious absorption, then uh, then service, and then working for any selfless cause, even if not service to him. So like that, bhakti is not just, not digital, but analog. And what we expect in the process of bhakti, it's a continued love for Krishna, freedom from material desires, opportunity for service, all these will gradually come. And we need to find out what is the way, what is my adhikar, what is my level right now from which I can sustain and practice bhakti. So any questions about this? Yes, please. How can we maneuver our way through the longest stage of Anatha Nirvati? Yeah, it's a, it's a long stage and it is also a stage where the further we go, the changes become slower. What do you mean by that is? See, when we are practicing, <laughs> when we are practicing bhakti initially, the transformation is quite dramatic. You know, we might be, we might be, say, eating meat or drinking or doing these X, Y, Z things, and we just decide to give it up and we give it up. <laughs> and we might have been trying for so long to give it up in the past, and we're not able to give it up, and now we give it. This is magical. <laughs> How did this happen? This, this is really magical. And as we take us in America, so there's a community. The biggest community of Prabhupada disciples is in a place called Alachua, called New Ramanriti. So there, the Prabhupada said, we telling me that at that time, Prabhupada was there, we were, after one or, one or two years of, we just experienced this transformation. We thought that, you know, in three, four years, we are going to take over the world, and in 10 years, we'll see Krishna, huh. and in 15, 20 years, we'll go back to Krishna. So that's what we were expecting. So the, initially, the transformation is quite dramatic. But as we progress in bhakti, the transformation happens much more gradually. It's happening, but it is gradual. It's just like, say, if we are growing. Say, when a baby is newborn, the baby's growth is quite significant. Every one month, sometimes if a small child is there, then the mother may keep, a, keep like a wall with the measurement. <laughs> this is the height in this month. This is the height in this month. And like a memento for the future. So, now, you can have that, maybe till the child is going to 10, 15, 17, 18. Now, after that, what happens? As compared to how much a baby eats, an adult eats much more, but grows much less. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is after you're 18 or 20, you're not really growing much. The growth is still there, but it's not that tangible. So of course, with respect to the body's growth, there's a limit. Beyond that, bodies are deteriorating. That's not like that in Krishna consciousness, spiritual growth. But the point is, as the when minutes with respect to gross anarthas, uh, giving them up happens quite dramatically and rapidly. But with respect to subtle things, it is quite gradual. So, so because of that, we might start feeling as if nothing is happening. Every day I wake up and I do this sadhana bhakti, I chant and I read and I do this puja and every day I still the same desire is coming, I still feel angry, I still feel envy, I still feel this way, that way, everything is still going on. So what is the transformation that is happening? So what I have found is that at this stage, to sustain ourselves in bhakti, we need to have some service which, which gives us the reassurance that we are doing something valuable in life. The transformation is happening, but because it is so gradual, 
we don't see it happening so quickly. So one way is that if we are sharing Krishna Bhakti with others and we see the transformation happening in them, that also gives us some conviction. Sometimes I give a class and now I have spoken that point many, many times. But sometimes some or some devotees come back and all new people come back. That's a brilliant point. You know, I feel this this was such a point in life. I was so depressed, but it's such a same way, really. What is so special? Then I start thinking about it. Sometimes when we see others inspired, then we also feel inspired. So outreach is very helpful in that sense. Where we are interacting with those who are experiencing the dramatic transformation of Bhakti. If you are only surrounded with uh, people who are serious practitioners or people who are mm, like going practicing for a long time, but who may not be serious practitioners now. So what happens? They all start complaining. <laughs> they start gossiping. You know, I read a very interesting definition of gossip. Gossip happens when we hear something we like about someone we don't like. <laughs> Here's something we like about someone we don't like. Oh, really? It's like that? She's like that? Okay. <laughs> then you have to share that with everyone else. So the point is that if we are, oh, we are in our own small community, which is good to be having connection in the community, but if if people have become lax, if people have become a little apathetic or skeptical or whatever, then it is, then we will also feel disheartened. So having some contact where we can see others being transformed, that is very, that is very helpful to sustain us. Another is, as I said, if we have a service which makes us feel that I am doing something worthwhile in my life, then that also gives us that conviction. Because uh, now that worthwhile could be whatever if we have we have some interests and we have some talents, we have some abilities and we want to make some contribution according to that. Maybe we do some art, we, even if we, we have managerial abilities, we do some management. So the inner transformation is happening gradually. But while that is happening, to sustain us, we need to have that sense of outer contribution. It may not, the contribution may not lead to any dazzling achievement. If it leads to that's wonderful. But even if it doesn't happen, at least then feel that I am able to contribute something. So then that's what helps us move on. And another thing that can help is if we have, if we have at least one or two good relationships, very, very close relationship where now our bond to, to Krishna, it is already there at some level, but it, it is developing gradually. If we have multiple bonds with those who are connected with Krishna, that also helps us keep moving on. So the somebody with whom we can do sharing of our heart, if we have that, that helps us to unburden ourselves. So especially someone who will hear us non-judgmentally. That's very important. Otherwise, sometimes our our spirituality, instead of making us more understanding of each other, it makes us more judgmental of each other. And then it becomes like a barrier. And we just can't speak anything to anyone. But if there is a if we have some social circle where there's, there's non-judgment, then it's very, very helpful. Because then we see, I am among like-minded people, I can share, I have these concerns. Then I will also have these concerns. And yeah, I can express myself. Our heart needs understanding as much as our body needs oxygen. And if we don't feel understood, then we start feeling something suffocated. So it's important to have at least one or two relationships like that. So those broad things I said that outreach where we see others being transformed, even if I transform very slow, but then I also, that we're doing some service which is adding some value uh, to our lives, where we feel we're doing something worthwhile to contribute. And uh, having some relationships where we can 
we can be ourselves that can help us sustain. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, yeah, so you were mentioning that um, it's a gradual process, but at the same time, um, the Hare Krishna Mantra has the potency to purify us immediately. So how do these go together? Okay. The Hare Krishna Mantra has the capacity to, to purify us immediately, but then it's a gradual process. Yes, it's like if, if we're told that you know, if somebody just hits the bullseye on the target in the Olympic Games, they will get the gold medal. Well, yes, that's true. But to hit the bullseye, you have to shoot not just at one target, but thousands and thousands of thousands and thousands of arrows or gunshots you have to do before that. So for that one pure chanting of the Hare Krishna Mantra, which can liberate us, which can give us love for Krishna, we have to chant many mantras that are actually purifying us. So it's a good in that sense, the Hare Krishna Mantra has the potency. But we can't access that potency right now. It is because uh, we are our we are not calling out from the heart. Our conscious our heart is not so receptive. So we are preparing the ground of our heart to be receptive. So when scriptures give some promises, we can say that those promises or some if you do this, this will happen. We can see those promises more as expressions of Krishna's compassion. And this is the magnitude of mercy that is possible. But that doesn't mean that is the magnitude of the mercy that is universal. It is possible. What is the difference, say, like in the Ajamil story? Now, Ajamil uh, lives, was initially quite virtuous, but then after that, he lives quite a devious life. And then at the end of his life, he just chants Narayan. And he's saying, now, if somebody draws the lesson from that, oh, let me also live deviously. <laughs> and then at the end of my life, or when I have decided I want to end my life, I'll take out a gun, put it on my head, pray Krishna. <laughs> I'll shoot myself. Now, will Vishwantas come over there at that time because he's chanted? No. That is not the lesson from it. The point is not just to call out, the point is also to remember. And whether one will remember the Lord or not, we don't know that. But the, the lesson over there is, Shukadeva Goswami also says that, and Prabhupada also says in his purport that, if Naif Ajami chanted one name, that also unintentionally. And he got so much mercy. And if we chant regularly and intentionally, and will we not get mercy? So sometimes the, the extraordinary examples of mercy or extraordinary proclamations about mercy, they are given to indicate the magnitude of the mercy of the mother. And they are meant not as a substitute, uh, as a, not as a replacement for the standard process for seeking mercy. They are meant to reinforce our practice of the standard process. Uh, it's not that, oh, if that happened to him, it should happen to me also. No. If that else can happen, then if I do this, this will surely happen. If I do this regularly, it will happen. So, Krishna's mercy is, in that sense, causeless. It's not that because I have done this, Krishna has to do this to me. But Krishna can give this much mercy also. It's like mercy means if we hear that some person has given $100,000 in charity and if we go to them and tell them, hey, you give that person $100,000, give me also $100,000 now. Mm -hmm. It's charity. It's up to them. How much? But if that person has given $100,000 there, surely they also get something. So these are more indicators of the magnitude of the mercy. They are not hyperboles. They are not exaggeration. It, it can happen, it has happened also. 
But that doesn't mean that's all will always happen. There is a standard process to be followed. And by that, we will get sure in mercy. That's the, that's the focus. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. How many stages of anatomy are there? And what's the lesson? Maybe I can talk about that tomorrow because I'll tell you in detail. Uh, then they are basically subcategories of analyzing and not work tomorrow. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. With, um, with the negotiation, let's go, and when you can't follow the instruction, can you give some advice as to the ones might often feel fearful to enter into that communication, like to say, oh, I don't feel like I can do that. Is there something else I can do, like to be okay. honest and feel safe to do that? Yeah, that's a challenge. If the negotiation stage we don't feel, we feel a little afraid to do that. Yeah, so then fear has a positive role and a negative role also. Fear can be a protector. If you say, if a child is leaning out of a 10 story building window and the child feels no fear and the parents will be in great fear. Hey, what are you doing? Come out. So fear can be a protector. In that sense, fear is not bad. But fear can also be a, you could say, a repressor. So that because of fear, we don't, on one side, because of fear, we will do, not do something that is dangerous. But because of fear, we may also not do something that is desirable. So what is, uh, a reasonable way to deal with it is that we try to have at least some devotees with whom we have a good relationship where we can express ourselves, even if it is not with directly with our authorities. And then sometimes, okay, I feel I can't do it, but maybe it's just I'm being sentimental and maybe I can do it, I don't know. So if we talk with somebody who's maybe an equal, and then they say that, okay, yeah, I think this, is, this is going to be tough. I understand why I don't feel like that. But then, if we get some perspective like that also, then we might also be able to understand and express ourselves better. And uh, then we can present our case more reasonably. Because ultimately, it's we who have the applied. And it's like, suppose somebody goes to a doctor. And before they sit on the doctor's, on the patient's seat, doctor says, okay, you take this medicine, you take this medicine, you take this medicine. Hey, but I didn't tell my symptoms. No, I already know your symptoms. <laughs> now, even if the doctor is expert enough to understand your symptoms by just observing the patient in a few moments, but still, unless the patient is convinced that the doctor has understood my symptoms, the patient will not take the medicine. <coughs> even if the medicine is right. The same way, if we feel we can't do something and still we say, we don't say it, then eventually we won't be able to do it very well. And even if we don't do it, we will be resentful about it. So then the connection with Krishna will not develop so much. So we may have to find out the appropriate way to express that by which we don't we don't um, come off as being disrespectful or rejecting their authority. But there is, each one of us has to find our space by which we can practice bhakti sustainability. And uh, it's, it's, it can also be gradual. It doesn't have to be like a sudden rejection. It can also be a gradual reorientation. I am doing this service, just like say if somebody is a is a preacher. Now I have I mean, I've traveled there are different kinds of preachers in the sense that there are some devotees who are crowd pullers. They get they they like to do big programs and they can get people and they can magnetize an audience. And some devotees are educators. They they are not interested in uh, say speaking jokes to entertain or something like that. They want to go deep into Shastra. So now we see that those who are educators, 
they might be best suited for teaching something like Bhakti Shastri to serious devotees. They're not really interested in going out to new people. And some people who are who are more like charismatic crowd pullers, if you ask them some technical question about Shastra, they 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 are not the right person to answer that question. So what happens is all of them are preaching, but they have found out their niche of it. I want to I want to teach, but I will teach Shastra. I want to teach new people. So like that, it needn't be that somebody is, uh, rejects rejects this and goes to something else. It can be a gradual orientation. This is reorientation. This is what I want to focus on. And gradually, if you do it, then it will not. Uh, come off as a rejection also. That's also one way we can do it. But uh, it's uh, sometimes it's more in our mind that, of course, one more factor is that sometimes if a particular service is absolutely needed and there's nobody to do it, then if we do it as a service, we'll also grow spiritually by that. But then that shouldn't be a, a constant situation where we have to do something which is incompatible to us just because it's a need. So it's a, it has to be a gradual adjustment. So occasionally doing something because it's needed, that's fine. But regularly doing something that we are not compatible with, that will that will burn us out. There was one devotee who told me that, all of you know pakodas? I think it's Indian, but I suppose it's made by devotees. So just, when, when people come new, we feed them fried pakodas. But when they become devotees, we fry them like pakodas. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to give some space to devotees also. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, please. If there, what is what is intense? Faith. 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 If I understand your question, what you're saying is if somebody has deep faith in the Lord, but then and they just want to naturally express it. Whereas in a community there are a lot of injunctions about how to do things. So those injunctions are you saying they come in the way of that that person's devotion? Or why why is the balancing between the two needed? Yeah, what so the injunctions come in the way of this uh, this person's practice of bhakti. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, naturally, because it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't or they don't click. Okay. So if there are injunctions which come in the way of the natural expression of devotion for somebody with deep faith, what can be done? See, there is for all of us. There is a personal space in which we practice bhakti. And there's a public sphere in which you practice bhakti. So now, in our personal space, well, what we do, it is we don't have to make a show of that to others. It's like suppose, suppose somebody comes to, uh, to you and says, yesterday Krishna came in my dream. Now, can Krishna come in our dream? Who are you to stop Krishna from coming? Exactly. <laughs> if Krishna wants, obviously he can come. <laughs> Krishna can come in anyone's dream. But if Krishna has come in the dream, that's wonderful. But the point 
point is that our spiritual advancement depends not so much whether Krishna comes in our dream or not. It depends on what we do after we wake up. <laughs> <laughs> because, see what happens is, <laughs> why is it like that? Because spiritual advancement is more a matter of exercise of our free will to move toward Krishna. And in the dream, we don't exercise free will, more or less. Dreams just come and we respond in some way to it. Sometimes people say, oh, it was like a dream. It, the, the meaning of all that is so wonderful. Everything went so wonderfully. But if you actually analyze, even in our dreams, we are not the complete controls. Things happen in our dream. Oh, this happened and I went there and this happened and that happened. In some dreams, we are just observers and things happen. And in some dreams, we are participants. But still, in no dream are we the complete controls. So the point I'm making is, what happens in a dream, usually there is no conscious exercise of our free will. So what happens in a dream is, if Krishna is coming in the dream, that's Krishna's mercy, and that's wonderful. But our spiritual advancement will depend on how we are, or how we are acting consciously when we have the opportunity to exercise our free will. So if somebody has got Krishna coming in their dream, well, that's wonderful. But they don't have to go and tell the whole world, oh, Krishna came in my dream, Krishna came in my dream. Therefore, I'm a pure devotee, offer obeisances to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Not like that. Okay, it's, 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 it's Krishna's mercy, that's wonderful. You might tell it to one or two devotees who we are very close to. So if Krishna is coming in our dream, that's in our personal space. We can have our reciprocation with Krishna, be grateful to Krishna, and that's nice. But in, our public, in the public sphere, we can practice bhakti like others. So, each one of us may have, say, a particular, a particular inspiration in our bhakti. And because all of us are individuals, so we all will have our individuality expressed in, Krishna, in bhakti. So, for example, even the altar. We might have Prabhupada, we might have our spiritual master, we might have we might have Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Nityanand Prabhu, we might have uh, we might have we have might not might have we have all of these Radha Krishna all of them. Now somebody might feel especially attracted to one of these personalities. I know devotees who just feel such a bond with Nityanand Prabhu. They feel Nityanand Prabhu is very close. So I know some devotees have memorized. Sections and sections of Chaitanya Bhagavat where prayers are being offered to Nityanand Prabhu and they constantly recite that. And it's wonderful. But if in the temple when the normal program is going on, they say, you know, why do we need to have all the other prayers? Let's all have prayers to Nityanand Prabhu. <laughs> no, if that's your personal inspiration, that's wonderful. But there is a standard process and there's no need to minimize that standard process. Somebody else may say that actually Radharani is the way to Krishna. So let's pray to Radharani. And if you please Radharani, then Krishna will be pleased. That's true. But if that's the personal inspiration, yes, you can read, you can offer more prayers to Radharani, learn, learn some bhajans about Radharani. So that's in our personal space. So in bhakti, you could say there are principles and there are preferences. References what I personally like, what I feel inspired by. So, uh, to we needn't impose our preferences on others. But we don't have to also abandon our preferences. That's our individuality. So, in our personal space, we can practice bhakti according to our preferences. So, of course, if it is something which is uh, significantly different from what everyone else is doing. Then it's good to at least inform some senior devotee who, who is like-minded so that we can have their guidance about how to go about doing that. But uh, there is no need to no need to necessarily see the two as contradictory. It's not that our our particular inspiration bhakti has to go against the injunction for everyone. We don't, we don't have to reject the injunction for others, but we don't have to necessarily think that that injunction 
is restrictive for us. If we have a personal inspiration bhakti, we can see that as a gift of Krishna to us. But that doesn't mean that is the gift that we're going to work for everyone. Or that everyone has to do it. I, whenever I take darshan, I like to recite some Sanskrit verses. Brahma Samhita or Bhagavatam prayer or something like that. That connects, just looking, I'm not so much a visual person, I'm more of a verbal person. So when I utter the words, that's when, oh, this is the Lord who has been described, this is the Lord over here. That's when I feel connected. So, I spoke this in a class once. When we are taking darshan, we can, we, can, we can recite some verses. So, sometimes, at one time I was doing, now I become too lazy. I would memorize one verse every day, one prayer, and offer that prayer to Krishna when I would take darshan. So, I was doing that for some time. So then I just spoke that in the class. And then after, and I spoke that after a couple, after a few days, one devotee came and told me that, he said that actually, earlier when I was doing darshan, I would just hear the Govinda, Madhi Purusha, it filled my heart with devotion. But now he told me, he memorized verses. So when I go in front of Krishna, I have so much tension that in front of Krishna, if I forget the words. <laughs> <laughs> So, no, then I, I told you, I did not say this as something which you should do. I feel like there is an example of how you can be personally resourceful or creative in finding out how best you connect with Krishna. So, if the Govinda Madhi Purusham itself is connecting with Krishna, so then there's no need to, for you to memorize the verses separately. So, we, we can have our personal inspiration in our to say, personal space and the public sphere. We go along with what everyone else is doing. Does that answer your question? So, thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tagaur Premanude.